program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. On a scorching hot afternoon's day here in the African bush, the team of Safari Live is heading out to find out where all of the animals are sheltering from the heat. This is Safari Live. Very good afternoon to all of you and welcome on our sunset safari. My name is Jamie and the man behind the camera is Viam, back from leave once again. And as I said, we're heading out into Juma, Arethusa and Cheetah Plains game reserves in the Sabi Sand in the Greater Kruger National Park area of South Africa. And I have to tell you that on this sunset safari, I imagine that the sunset will be welcomed by many of the creatures out here. I said it was scorching. Bearing in mind that we are not yet even in the middle of summer just yet, it is 37 degrees centigrade, so 98 Fahrenheit, and the sky is a funny yellowy, orangey, bluey kind of combination. There's obviously a fire blazing somewhere in the low felt, and the smoke is drifting across towards us. But yes, an interesting afternoon to be heading out on safari. Now, if you do have any questions for us, remember we are live, which means that anything could happen. And we welcome anything that you would like to ask or any comments that you would like to make. And you can do that on hashtag a safari live on Twitter. Or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv. Oh, the inimitable Brent Leo Smith is out with Brian on Wendy. We also have Mr. Henry. The wonderfully entertaining gentleman, keeping us um, company in the tent. And as far as I know, Steph will also be out on bushwalk this very fine afternoon. So we've got all kinds of exciting possibilities planned for you. As things start to get busier and busier for the Safari Live team. All kinds of exciting things planned. Some are surprise and some are not. We'll try and stop for these birds. But they are not cooperating stop stop you horrible creatures the bird party hmm there we go well done we've got a chagra we've got a bird feeding oh bye we had a chagra <laughs> sorry vimpy here's a drongo thank you okay well starting off our afternoon with a fork tailed drongo I think the other one was a brown crown chagra, but I was so busy remembering how to drive and actually stop the car that I didn't notice whether it was brown crowned or black crowned. And there is a massive buffalo herd somewhere in the middle of this block. I could see them from Impala Road, and I thought I'd try and do a loop just to see whether or not they'd be visible from the road, but they are deep in the block underneath the shade of some of the larger marula trees. I don't think they plan on coming out anytime soon. Oh! An afternoon like this afternoon, we will be heading to check the water holes. I think I imagine that Brent's plan will be something similar as well. And that's probably the best course of action for an afternoon like this afternoon. You don't have to just take my word for it. Let's head across to Brent so that he can say hello to you all and fill you in on his plans. Oh, hello. It is a blistering 37 degrees Celsius. It's well over 100 Fahrenheit. So if you look behind me, I'm doing exactly what the Inyalas are doing. I'm having a snooze in the shade. So I'm copying the wildlife today. Of course, my name is Brent. Uh, welcome on this live safari. I'm not going to lie here for too long. I've got my very good friend and uh, fellow killer bee, Brian, on the camera. And of course, this morning, unfortunately, the lions decided to leave us and go to Buffalo's Hook. So that's why you see we have a little lion cub who's going to be on the game drive with us. So we won't be without lions even though they might have departed. Now, as I was saying, you could see I was having a little snooze in the shade there. And I was doing the exact same as those. 
Carlo over my shoulder there. So what they've done is at the heat of the day, they've moved down towards a little river system like this and they're having a little schnooze. Now, of course, I have too much energy to schnooze at this time of the day. So I'm searching for elephants at the moment. I know there were some down and around the Juma Pan a bit earlier. So I've done a big loop. I haven't seen where they've come out. So hopefully they're around here somewhere. Now remember, this is a live African safari. And when I'm not snoozing, I do answer questions. And you can do that by sending the questions to questions at wildearth.tv. Or you can use the hashtag safari live on Twitter and see what happens. It's a good lesson for everyone. If you lay about at work, you get punished. Just as I have with a thorn in the back. Okay, there we go. Nasty little uh, buffalo thorn. Hmm. Well, that teaches you, don't lie around on the job. Now, of course, today is quite exciting because not only are myself and Jamie out and about in search of wonderful creatures, we've, of course, got the winter farmer, Stefan, around on foot looking for all sorts of wonderful little creatures and uh, James is back in his tent hopefully with lots of fascinating stories and creatures and drawings to show you and there we go our first animal apart from the snoozing in Yala although they're doing exactly the same in the shade there's a young snoozing male kudu now fortunately for us it, as I said it is very hot but it's quite a dry heat so it's actually quite pleasant out here well I suppose it depends if you like being hot or not I find I find it very pleasant and look who's decided to come join us now see so you can see the kudu are looking at something and something's just walked out of the little river system you can see his dark shape there he is let's see if we can get a bit of a better view oh no, there he is and lift his head for us Nice big male giraffe. Now, of course, quite apt that we see giraffe today, since today is the day that some a very interesting research was released. And it was always considered to be one species of giraffe with multiple subspecies. There are now four different species of giraffe and subspecies off those four. Now, this is the southern giraffe. And lots of oxpeckers on his head, eating all the little ectoparasites, ticks and fleas and whatnot. Oh, he's pushing the kudu out of the shed. Shame on you, Mr. Giraffe. Kudu have moved now. Now, even though it is hot, normally you'd find giraffe not doing, being too mobile this time of the day. Because of the drought, the bigger animals are going to have to move around more and feed more. In particular, elephants, but also giraffe. Here we go, eating a quarry bush. Now, a quarry bush, if I remember correctly, the Afrikaans name for it is a thibos, which means a tough bush. So, not very tasty, not very appetizing, but one of the few evergreens that's still sporting leaves, and a lot of animals are taking the chance to eat, well, not taking the chance, are forced into eating stuff they would not normally eat. Normally, a giraffe would prefer a nice sweet kesha, but in drought, one must eat what must, one can. Now, I'm also listening very carefully while we sit here for those elephants. I wonder where they've gone to. Now, apart from it being a whopping 37, which I think is a hundred and... 100 and? 97, 98. No, I think it must be over 100. 40 is 104. 98. Well, it feels like it's over 100. Um, is that there's a quite a stiff breeze. Now, whenever there's a stiff breeze in the bush, it does make certain species of animals a little bit jumpy. Although in the heat, they might not be too bad. But let's leave Gerald the giraffe to munch on his tie boss, his tough bush. 
and hopefully catch up with these eddies. I haven't seen any tracks crossing here, so they should be around. Now, oh, James Richards hoping for lots of elephants today. Me too, James. And with this heat, I think a lot of us are planning, well, Jamie and I are certainly planning to hit the water holes. Yee, elephants. There we go. Hello, little one. Where's the rest of your herd? I think they're on this little road that goes down into the Mwati River. Now, elephants, there we go. You can see slightly nervous, so that's why I've stopped. Elephants in the wind as well sometimes can be a little bit unrelaxed. So what I'm going to do is stop, let the little guy relax. I'm pretty sure the rest of the herd is in the shade below him in the river system, in the mighty Mwati or well, a raging sand river. I hasn't seen, I don't think I've seen it flow since I've been here. But of course these little rivers do flow seasonally. If there's enough rain about. Hey, little one. If you listen carefully, it is quite hard with this wind. You can just hear what almost sounds like an elephant blowing dust or blowing, yeah, blowing dust down below. This time of the day always amazes me how absolutely still it is. There's not almost not even a bird moving around us. The odd hornbill making a noise and everything seems to move more slowly in the heat. You see on the opposite bank, Brian, Okay. Yeah, get no, just go. I want to show. You. I think it's in that. Oh no, I don't know if you're going to be able to see it. Let me just go back a little bit. Now, incredibly, an animal as massive as an elephant can disappear into the bush. Now, if we look through there, that is an elephant. <laughs> you just occasionally see a little flick of the tail. There we go, you can see the ears and the trunk now. There we go, starting to make out. Wonderful. So there's a herd here. Now I want to go... Do you think they've drunk yet? I don't know. Well, I'm going to try to see if we can get a view down into the river uh, of all these elephants while I move around. Uh, Jamie has got another great grey beast to show you. <laughs> Red Dam, checking all of the water holes. We have a pretty standard resident now at one of the few water sources remaining on Arethusa, a big bull hippo that has taken advantage of the pumped water hole. Oh, giving us a little bit of a demonstration of the world famous hippo tail dung flick. You can see he's a little bit unsettled, so I've been giving him plenty of space. Now typically a hippo in water is one of the most comfortable creatures on earth but as their water holes start to shrink they become more insecure they can't actually fully uh, submerge themselves and a result, as a result they become more nervous and also slightly more aggressive. Now we're giving him plenty of space between ourselves and the vehicle. He's looking okay. He's not looking as bad as some of the hippo we've seen over the drought in the last few months and weeks. Gonna, oh, is it going to roll? I think he's going to give us a full roll. Submerging his back, cooling it down since it's been out of the water over the last few hours. Oh boy. Keeping a very, very close eye on us. Their skin is incredibly sensitive to the sun, which is one of the big reasons why they are, during the day, much solely aquatic creatures. 
The drought is forcing them more and more onto land, particularly because it's very difficult for them to meet their nutritional requirements, to, to eat as much as they need to eat in order to sustain their massive body size. Look how perfectly adapted he is to live in the water. And his eyes and his ears are situated right at the top of his head so that he can rest underwater and still keep an eye or an ear out on whatever's going on around him. He doesn't have any major injuries, which we typically see with these big bull hippos at this time of year and during these drought conditions, just because they spend a lot of time fighting with each other over water sources. Now on a good year, when there's plenty of water around, the hippopotamus are more than happy to share and share alike and they'll all be in the same big water hole and nobody really has a problem. But as those areas, areas start to shrink, it becomes more and more difficult and they become cagier and cagier until eventually they get to the point where they start to seriously fight each other. And hippo can mortally wound each other with those massive tusks that protrude from their mouths. The bottom ones are forward facing like daggers and the top ones downward facing to create the perfect weapons. Shame boy. And of course he's also got to share this water hole with animals that might decide to come and have a drink. We saw the other day we had Impala walking up towards the pan and they were chased away by the hippopotamus. <coughs> and Gracie, I was so hoping that you were watching this afternoon because I know that hippo are one of your favorite animals. So Gracie is nine years old and wants to know, can hippo see underneath the water, the surface of the water, or do they close their eyes? And the answer is they can see underneath the surface of the water. So what they do, as you know, Gracie, hippo are one of the few animals that can't actually swim. So what they do instead is they walk, they sink to the bottom and they walk along. If it's deep water, they'll walk along the bottom of the water. And to do that, they have to look where they're going. Make sure they don't bump into anything, maybe into a rock or perhaps a crocodile. Although crocodiles are not a threat to a big hippopotamus. You'll be happy to know that this particular hippo is looking very, very healthy. So he's still okay. He's not too thin. He's not injured. And at least he's got the water at Red Dam, which they will continue to pump for as long as they can. And it looks as though, somewhat tragically, that the predictions of the La Nina rainfall that was meant to come, and we were going to have lots and lots of rain early in the year, it's starting to look less and less likely. There have been a few articles recently that basically have said that it's probably not going to happen and that South Africa is going to stay in the grips of this drought. And as a result, well, we don't know exactly what's going to happen. Brian is convinced that it's going to rain on the 20th, but I don't know. Ailey Shiva, very, very good point from you because I've just automatically said to you it's a he and I haven't really explained to you how I know that. And it's actually quite difficult with adult hippopotamus. The thing that you're really looking for is the size of a bull hippopotamus. They are bigger than the females. And their head structure, the, the sort of the bones of the skull are slightly more defined. It's also just in terms of behavior. Um, the fact that he has managed to secure this, what is at this point a prime position for a hippopotamus, might not look it. He might not be fully submerged, but there are a lot of hippopotamus out there that we've seen and encountered every now and again that are standing all on their own in the shade of the vegetation trying to survive the day because they haven't managed to get themselves to a water hole and get themselves into a comfortable position. I know that I, I know now that these two, this hippopotamus and the one that was at Arethusa Dam and moves between there and Simbombili, I know that they've been fighting a great deal. <coughs> I've heard the other guys talking of it, which is why I was actually quite surprised to see that he is uninjured, relatively uninjured. Sure. This wind doesn't help either. 37 degrees is one, one thing, but when you add wind as well, you basically double the evaporation effect that it has. And whilst Red Dam is pumped, just bear in mind that that water has to come from somewhere. And they're bringing up it up from deep beneath the surface of the soil, but that is not an infinite supply. 
and at some point it will have to be stopped unless it rains of course as i said brian predicts early rain brian seems to know things that other people don't what do you think vm have you given a date yes i said the first of first of first of october We've got a bet going as to when the first 20 mil plus rain will be. I said the 23rd of October. We've all been super optimistic. There are those, there are thoughts that it's not going to happen until December, but let's cross that bridge if we, if and when we come from it. For now, our poor hippo will just have to try and make do with the amount of water that he has. Of course, the Sabi sand did try and lessen the effect of this situation by removing a number of hippopotamus to parts of South Africa where there's a little bit more water. Sure. There you go, another roll. I'm hoping that he might give us a full roll, which is quite rare to see. I don't think so, he's just shifting and dampening the skin on his back. He's also displaying a little bit for us, so it's not, it's, it's multi-purpose. Now Haley has said that she always thought that water would make your skin burn more in the sun. Um, perhaps pool water or ocean water, but I think that's actually more with, with, with people. It's more because their sunblock gets washed off and they spend a lot of time in the, the extra reflection of the surface of the water it increases the sunburn effect for the hippopotamus in a, in, a, in a muddy pool if it was deep enough to cover him up then it would be absolutely fine he'd be away from the glare it absorbs most of it and their skin does lose moisture very very quickly that's one of the reasons why they try not to stand out in the sun they do secrete a red substance known as blood sweat it is not actually blood sweat but it is a, a sort of red oily substance that acts, scientists are now discovering, acts as both a sunblock and an antibacterial, it has an antibacterial effect to so sort of help clean out wounds on the hippo skin because as you can imagine they live in dirty muddy water all the time and as we can see have no compunction about defecating which is what he's been doing while we've been sitting here. So as you can imagine even the smallest cuts could potentially become very very infected very quickly. That's why they secrete that antibiotic style liquid and it's something that scientists and biologists have been really looking into the chemical structure of to try and imitate for sunblock for human beings. Which is of course, we're, we're both wearing multiple layers of sunblock this afternoon, trying to shelter ourselves from the sun. And on that note, I think we're going to keep moving. We're going to try and move into a dense drainage line area where there's plenty of shade and where hopefully the animals will be hiding out as well. Let's go back across to Brent and his other very large animal. There we go. We've got down into the Mawati riverbed and we're sitting with the elephants. Isn't this absolutely beautiful? Now, if elephants, if they could, I'm sure, would like to have a rest and a snooze in the heat of the day. But unfortunately for them and their large body size, they have to keep constantly eating. Uh, to make sure they've got enough sustenance. A nice big adult female here. And she's actually getting right under an old fallen tree and getting any little bit of vegetation that other animals might not have been able to get to. So we actually, a lot of elephants around here. Uh, we're probably about 25 or 30 spread through this area. Unfortunately, we only get a really good view of one. The others are up in the Tumbuti thicket, enjoying a bit of shade. Now, I found out some interesting information about this very dry period we're going through. So reliable weather records have been kept in South Africa since about 1903. 
and this is the driest ever recorded period since then. And of course, as in with every year when the rains come, the Wild Earth crew have their rain bets. Brian, you were this month. Yep, 20th. 20th of September. Oh, yes. Brian thinks it's going to rain. I think Dave was 18th. 18th. Viam can't remember the last time I asked him. Uh, but I think you're all wrong. I say it's going to be, I say the 10th, no, I said the 20th, I think, of October. X Ranger would like to know, what does the winner of the rain bet win? Well, massive bragging rights, of course, and uh, sort of, well, I suppose it gives you sort of voyeuristic powers to see the future. He thinks it's going to rain on October 5th. That is the beginning of daylight savings for them. Well, Kathy, I like your... October's a good month. Better than September, Brian. Now the great floods are coming. The great floods are coming. Of course, there's much debate uh, about... Well, apparently, I've been saying La Nina wrong. Uh, how else would you say La Nina? La Nina. La Nina. There we go. La Nina. There we go. And uh, my current research into La Nina. I want to do one with La Nina. La Nina. La Nina. Is uh, that it is, risen, is dropped to a 12% chance. So it looks like we're in for another very dry patch. So no. So, but then how do we say El Nino? El Nino. El Nino. So we're in El Nino, not La Nina. Now, one of the reasons elephants have to eat so much is that their digestive system isn't the most effective out in the bush, unlike a ruminant. They only successfully digest about 65 to 70 percent of what they eat. Now, that is a food source for other animals, particularly quite a few bird species. Now, the reason they're probably designed like this is, well, they're great fertilizers. And if they were efficient they wouldn't push down as many trees and break as many branches and the bush actually needs that and elephants are one of our keystone species so they have the ability to shape and change the bush particularly in a very dry year like this so it's, it's really important to have healthy populations of elephants oh dear Brian they're starting I thought we might have a month or two without them oh. The wind is keeping it away. I'll see if it lands on me again. But tiny little stingless bees that with the lack of water uh, decide your eyes, the moisture from your eyes and your sweat is a great source of moisture. They literally buzz around you. Now you can't squash them either. Because if you squash one, it releases a pheromone that lets all the others know where you are. And there must be a water source if you're protecting it and squashing them. Oh, there we go. There's one, Brian. Oh, it took off again. Come, I'm letting you down on me. Only this once. There we go. Oh, it's taken off again. So, oh, and the wind's got him. They are also called Mapani bees. And Mapani country is quite dry country. It normally it's found a bit further north. And when you get into the, the Mapanis in the dry season, and there's no water about it. Literally swarm around your your head. They can be very oh, like that one's doing to me now. They can be very very irritating. I'm just gonna try reposition. See if we can get a better view of those helis under the shade. And escape before my piney bees all find out where I'm hiding. How's that looking, Brian? Maybe back a bit more? Okay. Good. So there we go. 
those ones are taking a, a break from feeding and uh, having a little rest in the shade. Oh! Sound like there's some more at the Juma waterhole. Unfortunately, they're guests in camp, so we aren't able to go there just yet. Magical creatures, Ellie's. Now, since it's so hot and we, we're doing what all the other animals are doing, we're sitting in a little riverbed, I think I've got a quiz for you. Hmm. I think it should be on elephants, since we are looking at these magnificent beasts. What country in Africa has the largest population of savanna elephants? What country in Africa has the largest population of savanna elephants? If you know the answer, questions at wildearth.tv or hashtag safari live on Twitter. And of course, there you go. As the ivory. It's not always about the big hairies and scaries. If we come out, Brian, um, there's a little chagra. Okay, a little bit to the right. And a zoom on the base. That fallen log there. There he is. Hello. If you sit quietly for a while in places, you get to see things like Oh, quite nice sightings of chagras and robins. They are what you call skulking species. So they tend to scuttle about in the undergrowth like that and constantly on the move, even in this heat. Not very vocal at the moment, but on the move. Looking for any unsuspecting insect. Now we're going to sit here, relax with the Ellies, but without further ado, there's someone who would like to bid you a good afternoon from uh, what I think we're calling the sauna. So let's go see who it is. It is not in fact a sauna, it is rather pleasant here in my tent. Eggsy is on camera. Welcome back from leave, Eggsy. Thank you. Yes, lovely to have you with us. I'm glad you don't have any further ink to your body. Yes, the amount you have right now is quite sufficient. My name is James Hendry and we're sitting in a, what is sort of a museum slash tent idea here and we're all sort of getting gearing up for uh, a sort of expanded version of the show I suppose and we're hoping that the tent will be here almost permanently. We're as live as Brent and Jamie are which means we'd love to hear from you. Hashtag Safari Live Question at WildEarth.TV. I'm trying to be able to say that in two seconds. The first amazing thing I'm going to show you from here is a feed from the microscope. Exe, would you have a look here? There we are. And now... ...flower is rather... You lost audio because we came back. Okay, right, okay, I'm with you now. Anyway, uh, we will be able to see this again in much better detail. Uh, I don't think we can use a microscope right now. Let me just pull it out. Um, Eggsy, and in fact, you know what, Eggsy, can you put your camera on that screen over there and see what that looks like? Tell me if it looks horrid or if it looks okay. It looks... Uh, horrid? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, there you are. That's a br brief version. I'll tell you what it is now. Okay. One of the first flowers of the spring, the second flower, we've had the knob thorns, many knob thorns around now. This is a lovely flower called Mbezan. So if you are perhaps a younger viewer or just an older viewer wanting to engage in audience participation, Mbezana, otherwise known as the Bushman's Grape or in Afrikaans the Pardipus, which means the horse's urine plant. And that's because it smells of horse's urine. <laughs> Would you like to smell it, Eggsy? Are you sure? Are you quite sure? Anyway, that's what it smells like, and uh, very nice to see that it's blooming just outside the tent here. Geraldine, turn your telephone off or I shall beat you. We are live. <laughs> now, come and have a look over here. 
Linda, you say this is your first time in the tent and should you be scared? Linda, it is my considered opinion that you should be terrified out of your wits. Um, the tent is a terrifying, terrifying, scary place. There are dead things all over it. Look at it, Eggsy. There are, there's just a lot of death in here. Uh, well, I mean, if you were to come it's quite likely we'd have to dissect you. Uh, but given the, the distance that you have from us now, I think you'll be okay. Now, one of the stars of the Father's Day show, Igzy, if you put the camera there, was these amazing stingless bees that live in the skull of Gerald the giraffe. Now, were the microphone working, and microscope working, uh, we'd be able to show you you can see there the little stingless bee going in and out, retreating and coming, uh, sort of uh, coming out to build that little waxy tunnel. Now we'll try and just give you another view using the same screen technique as we used. So Eggsy will just watch me do this, then I shall get a picture on it. There we are, Eggsy. You can put it on the screen now if you don't mind. Now just watch there. Look, there he is. Can you see him, Eggsy? This is fantastic. Now everybody, there are a few teething problems here in the new tent set up here. Uh, it is very out of Africa, of course, but for Meryl Streep and old Robert Redford, uh, it's virtually the same. And eventually you will be able to look at this in glorious high definition. It won't be Eggsy filming a feed from it. Isn't that amazing? And I think these little things are going to become the stars of our show. I know Karula and Shongila and Hosanna and the Nkuhumas and their little cubs and all the elephants, the half-trunk herd. They're our favorite characters, but these chaps have been something of a revelation. They've been living in this giraffe skull now, I think, probably for the best part of a year. I think we first discovered them during the Big Cat Week uh, in February, and maybe even just before that. So we hope that they are going to uh, continue to live there. Don't go anywhere, see? They make a very delicious but quite sour honey. And these are stingless bees. There we are. <coughs> Excuse me. I think I inhaled a piece of giraffe skull. Right, <coughs> that's the giraffe skull. Uh, we're going to find various things out here. Just before we uh, go across to Jamie, I just want to show you our surrounds over here. Uh, there is quarantine clearings, that is up there. The western horizon off to that sort of side over there, and then the sun will come up over that way. And this, just take a note of this, because by the time our TV shows come round in January, and we're broadcasting from here, this will be verdant green, if we get any rain. Let's head across to Jamie and find out what she has to show you. Well, I did have some kudu to show right. you. Um, I think they've gone. Oh, there's one. There is the disappearing back. It's like a fish mouth. Audio's still on. No one knows why. Oh, yeah. It does look like a fish moth, doesn't it? We're still live with audio, everybody. Days. Mm -hmm. Usually the animals Maybe are out on the top of the banks, where it's shady, but there's like also a little bit of a breeze. So they don't Jimmy's really sit in the middle in the of the drain class, but they do sit... Oh, goodness. I'm going to go tumbling down. No. No, those could you have gone. They have absolutely vanished. I will try one more time, but either way, you can carry on with us along our river cruise. Uh, we're in the almost in the exact spot. If you cast your mind back, those of you who've been watching for a considerable period of time, this is where the Nkuhumas had a buffalo kill before the Birmingham boys conducted their takeover. So we had an amazing sighting of the Nkuhumas. It's where, for those of you who look back, you'll remember James had this incredible sighting where one of the lionesses, and I think it was amber eyes went and stood and stared straight at him straight into his eyes and just stared she just so we are behaving in 
just like the elephants at the moment. So while we're not live, we're sitting in the shade. And my ears aren't flapping quite as much as those eddies are, but let's go have a look. Now, of course, an elephant's ears, ears are its air conditioning system. And even though they're standing very still in the shade, their ears are flapping away. Now, they can have about 8 litres, which is just under 2 ga gallons, US gallons. I know there's lots of different types of gallons, but 2 US gallons of blood in their ears. So, as the blood's cooled by the flapping ears, it's transported through to the rest of the body. And this is one of those incredible evolutionary adaptations that it enables elephants to sleep, I mean, sorry, to I said sleep, and I'll tell you why in a second, but to feed and move throughout the day. Now, elephants very seldom sleep, but Brian's on the super zoom, and he's on the trunk, but if he goes a little bit to the left, down on the ground, Brian, I just noticed it now. Keep going. Keep going. Look at that there. <laughs> Fast asleep. <laughs> I just saw it at the last second. That's why I said sleep when I was talking about air conditioning. So when they are young, the little ones on really hot days like this will absolutely have a snooze. I've even heard them snore. And look at that. Now, just have a close look. Sorry, I'm leaning in there. Well done to Raisa Sylvia. Oh, it looks like it's dreaming. Raisa Sylvia and Kelly, many others were correct. The African country that has got the largest population of savannah elephants is indeed Botswana. Most of those are all up in the north of the country. I'm quite jealous of that little guy. Looks like he's really comfortable. That just special. Two little twitches on his nose every now and then. Now, of course, in droughts like this, the young do have quite a hard time. Although I don't think, I think this one's just having a snooze. It's quite, quite common for baby Eddies to do that at this time of the day, especially with the heat we're experiencing today. Isn't that absolutely wonderful? Now, we can have a nice look at that foot there and you can see the toenails quite clearly now that is an incredibly designed shock absorber to be able to take the massive body weight of an elephant so the bones from those toes actually go upwards and you can see that sort of almost conical shape there now in between those bones is a massive cartilaginous sponge a big shock absorber that enables them to carry that massive weight. And it's obviously more pronounced in the front feet, and that's a front foot, because they've got to carry that massive shoulders and heavy head of an African elephant. Now, of course, Eddies don't have to trim their toenails like us, and it happens naturally as they walk through the bush. Hi Susie. Susie's in Florida. Susie says, do any of the older elephants accidentally step on the little one? 
uh, I've seen them sort of bump it, but not sort of step on top of, but sort of bump with their foot. Yes, it does happen from time to time. Okay. Now, even though those Ellie's are standing, they are sort of dozing mm -hmm. rather than full sleeping. lovely long eyelashes. Of course they're there for protection against all the sticks, spines and thorns while they're feeding. Isn't this absolutely magical? And can you believe we didn't even notice that little Ellie earlier. sleeping there, or just one, I think maybe just one. Maybe more than one. Maybe it's a little elephant pal. No, I can only see one. I'm hoping later they might head for a bit of splishing and splashing in the Juma pan. But at the moment this little herd looks quite content. As are the killer bees. Very content to sit with the elephants. They do give you a well, me and okay, give me a V. Lovely feeling of sort of well-being. Like all is right in the world when you're surrounded by elephants. <laughs> I think some people might disagree with me. What do you think, Brian? Mm, definitely. Definitely. James Dungan. Now, James is asking about something that Brian and I had a long chat about this morning. We actually even did a bit of Googling after drive about the new anthrax that's been found in the northern forests. Um, well, it's not that new. Uh, so from the reading we did, it's found in 2001 originally on a chimpanzee. Now, which makes it quite unusual. It's a cousin of anthrax. It's not really an anthrax. But it actually, you need two separate bac bacteria to be together for it to become fatal. Normally, it's, it's not fatal at all. But there have been very few recorded cases, but uh, it has been known about since 2001. I can't remember its name offhand. Uh, do you remember its name, Brian? Uh, I remember. I did save its name, just in case someone asked a question just like James. Saved that name. Oh, I'll have to check later. It's on my iPad. Now, John's wondering whether elephants are all facing separate ways to protect the youngster. I think it's more to take advantage of the shade, John. But elephants do corral around youngsters when there is a threat, but there's no threat currently. There we go, I found that now. 
it's a bacillus which is the same family as anthrax now i'm actually surprised we haven't had any more anthrax in this area uh, during the drought it does come through from time to time There we have Bacillus cerus, cerus, which is a co has co-opted the two pathogen segments of DNA uh, that made it as dangerous as its cousin, Bacillus anthracicus. So they have known about it for quite some time, but uh, they've been trying to figure out what it is. And so far, it's been found in goat, gorilla, elephant, and chimps. And they're still working on how it is dis dispersed. So, of course, anthrax is dispersed in the spores of a fungi. That bacteria needs that fungus to procreate and multiply. But we're going to sit here with these eddies. As I said, I'm hoping they're going to head for a drink shortly. And we're going to wait to go see them a splishing and a splashing while we do that. Jamie has got probably one of the happiest birds uh, because it's a drought. Very happy and it looks like very productive white-backed vultures sitting on their nest. A sort of random tangled collection of twigs and branches. A raptor's any raptor's bird's nest looks totally ridiculous. It always looks as though the slightest breath of wind could blow it down. And yet that is not the case at all. They're actually surprisingly solid structures. And just have a look at this nest and then look at the branch that is slightly below it. And you'll see that it is covered in weeks worth, quite possibly years worth, of white-backed vulture excrement. And that tells me something which we sort of already knew about white-backed vultures, and that is that they often return to the same nest site year after year. Just like our Warburg's eagles that we sit and watch that have just returned to the South African shores and just returned to their nest, we've got a beautiful pair of white-backed vultures sitting on top of their nest. So monogamous birds, to a point in that they will meet up and they will raise the chicks together, but you do see them mating with different birds as well, so it's, it's not a hundred percent true monogamy. You'll often, when you see vultures gathered in large groups, you'll see them mating quickly with different partners, with different males and females. So it's not a hundred percent faithful monogamy, but this male and female pair here will probably, well, will actually devote their, both of their attentions to looking after their new brood. Now, being white-backed vultures, they should be laying their eggs soon, if not already. And one of the things that they could be doing at the moment, now, in those of you watching in Europe or America, a lot of you will be familiar with the idea of birds sitting on their eggs to keep them warm. In mm -hmm. South Africa, we have a completely different problem, and that is that the birds need to keep their eggs cool. So lots of different birds from our vulture parents here, and I think they might be trying to shade their eggs a little bit, to ostriches, to lapwings, all of them have evolved different ways of keeping their eggs cool, cool on hot days like today. And it's amazing how obviously instinctively, instinctively they know which temperature they will have to sit and stand guard over the eggs during the day and just shelter them from the beating rays of the sun. The interesting thing about vultures, or white-backed vultures, not all vultures, white-backed vultures, is that they choose to nest on the top of knobthorns, which is a peculiar choice because knobthorns are probably one of the most unstable of all of the trees. In this case, they're actually sitting in a dead tree standing, so to speak. It's been completely ring-barked by the elephants, so they've stripped away the bark there at the base, and what that means is that the tree is not getting any nutrients, there's no cambium layer remaining, which means the xylem and the phloem, that contain both water and nutrients respectively, will not be functioning. In other words, that tree is going to die. And their time, sitting on the top of that nest and the top of that tree, will be limited as the borer beetles and the termites start to rot that tree away. 
Knobthorns are also incredibly unstable trees. They have relatively shallow root systems, which is why on a heavy, heavy sort of windy day, you should never rest in the shade of a knobthorn and you shouldn't pitch your camp underneath a knobthorn tree because they are liable to blow over. It's interesting that it's the approach of the white-backed vulture to, to nest on the top of a knobthorn tree. It does make sense that they take a relatively sparsely vegetated tree, so something that doesn't have much in the way of leaves, unlike the hooded vulture that prefers to nest in the dense green jackalberries and right beneath the canopy where their nests are hidden. The white-backed vultures don't have the same level of agility, which is why we always, I mean, most of you will know that by now, we, we always talk about the fact that when vultures sit, come down to roost, they usually pick dead trees just because it's so much easier for them to land and to take off. And they nest at the, right at the tip-top of the trees for that exact same reason. It's just easier for them to fly in. And so, what they will do when the eggs start to hatch is they will carry on their usual scavenging bent. And I know that Brent said that these are probably some of the happiest birds around. And yes, absolutely they will be, and they will continue to be happy birds throughout the dry season. They might even start to get to the point where they don't even need to share carcasses with lions and hyenas and other such predators. And a very big hello to all of the uh, teachers at the Unconference. It is lovely to have you on board. Just a very quick introduction. My name is Jamie and I have Viam, the man behind the camera. Viam's quite camera shy, so the most you might see of him is the odd thumbs up every now and again. And we've got this amazing project going where essentially what we do is we broadcast live safaris twice a day, every day, for three hours in the morning and three hours in the afternoon. I'd love to tell you how it works, but I have absolutely no idea. There's some technology that happens, it is totally over my head, but it does work and it means that we bring you a broadcast live from the middle of the African bush. To be more specific, for those of you familiar with this uh, geography of this area, we are on Juma, Arethusa and Cheetah Plains Game Reserve. The Mopani bees are trying to climb into my eyeballs. Please don't. They're desperate for moisture at the moment. It's boiling hot this afternoon. But we're coming to you from the sort of northern Sabi sand area, so right up on the border, close to Orpen Gate, the border of the Kruger National Park, and of course, completely open to that vast wilderness area. And starting off this afternoon with a nesting pair of white backed vultures. We try that all again. I'm so sorry for those of you who were watching at the Teachers Unconference. I'm not sure whether or not you could hear any of that introduction. But my name is Jamie and the gentleman behind the camera is Viam. And we are sitting with a pair of white-backed vultures perched on the top of a tree. Okay, well, apparently you guys can't hear us all that well, but for those of you who are watching on our live stream, let's pop over to Brent and see what's happening there. Brent has never looked so good. I'm obviously joking. Come inside, everybody. I have found you an Uthika from a, well, from a praying mantis. It's a very small one and what it's sitting on is something called Catenarigum spinosa and that is the spiny bone apple. And there's a very fancy word you can learn when you talk about the thorns that are at these sort of perpendicular, at least, um, yes, perpendicular angles. Uh, they are called decusate. Can you say that, Eggsy? Decusate. Decusate. Well done, Eggsy. Come with me, please. <laughs> Let us go and put this under the microscope and have a see what it looks like. I'm going to sit down, Eggsy, because that is what my exalted designation allows me to do. You will remain standing, of course, sorry for you. Now, let's go a little bit up here. Eggsy is just back from leave, by the way. He was uh, holidaying. Where were you holidaying, Eggsy? Pretoria. In Pretoria. What a wonderful place for a holiday that must have been. It was wonderful. Yes. Right, there we are. 
How's that look, everybody? There's the Uthika of a very tiny praying mantis. I hope that you can still hear me. Kirsten, can you still hear me? Excellent! That is good news indeed. Isn't that rather special? And I'm just going to turn it around a little bit. Let me just whip it out. Hold on a sec. Yoop, yoop. It's back. Fear not. And what you can see there is the unbelievably fine hairs that it's made of. And that's a kind of silk, in much the same way that a caterpillar will make a silk cocoon. Isn't that amazing? And it's silver. It's a glorious silver colour. I'm not entirely sure at this stage how to turn uh, the light down. Uh, so I'm going to leave it like that for now. But if I was to turn the actual light down, it would be much more silver. So tiny, tiny, tiny. Now I'm, we're going to come. I'm going to pull this out now. Um, if you have a look at it here, it's only about whoa, about a centimeter and a half across, so less than an inch, and that means it's a very tiny little mantis. And I suspect quite strongly that it's adapted to living. It's probably very well camouflaged, and I suspect that it's adapted to living on the slightly yellow flowers of Catarigum, Catanarigum spinosa, the spiny bone apple. So I'm going to put him back in the wild and hope that he, well, he manages to come out of that Uthika and enjoys a long and full summer. And hopefully Brent's predictions of 12% La Nina are incorrect. All right, so that's that little thing there. Then, very cleverly found by young Taylor McCurdy today, uh, well, in fact, a combined effort between Taylor and Geraldine. What we have here is a bulb, and I've often said to you, a bulb like this gives rise to something succulent, often something like a tall white squill. And here, everybody, is what the squill's flower looks like. Isn't that nice? Very nice, Eggsy. Not blurry safaris today, that's fantastic. <laughs> Good news. Now, let's have another little look under the microscope. It's such a joy to be able to look at things in this sort of detail. Oh, we look at that. Isn't that gorgeous? Mm. So, you can see the individual parts of the plant now. What we have there, obviously the petals, I think those are called petals, uh, it de depends on their sort of structure whether they're petals or sepals. Then what you can see are the male and female parts of the flower. You've got the anthers which are the yellow things there with the pollen on them and then at the top there you've got, if I'm not mistaken, the stigma and into that stigma, into that tube that you can see on the top of the flower, I'll just vary the focus slightly so you can, there you are. Ooh, too much. Not enough lubrication here. There. The middle bit there, that middle tube, is the stigma. And what will happen is that those little flower, um, sort of, uh, not flowers, those little pieces of pollen, if you like, you can see one to the bottom and to the right and the bottom right petal, that kind of little pollen grain will go into the tube down, down, down into the ovum, which is that green bit underneath the tube, and that will create fertilization, which will in turn produce something resembling a fruit. I'm not sure what it looks like on a tall white squill. And eventually that will desiccate, fall to the ground, and become a great big tuba, like this. Isn't that a nice story, Igzi? That's beautiful. Are you so amazed? Yes. He's so amazed, everybody. Good. Ooh. Now, we can hear just beyond the tent here the shouting of elephants. So let's go and have a look at some with Brent Leo Smith. So we're still with this beautiful little herd, but I'm starting to hear. Did you hear that, Brian? I did. So the eddies sound like they're fighting up near the water. Uh, I'm hoping Taxon gets out soon so we can go have a look. That was a weird one, that one. He's been listening to us to say, saying, La Nina. Trying to copy us. 
Is the little one? Is he up? No, he's still snoozing. He's up. You can't see him, but he is up. Oh, there he is. So maybe they'll get moving towards the water shortly. They are looking a little bit more awake than they were earlier, so hopefully they are going to move towards the water. And it is fantastic to get there before they do, because they get that water walk, that swagger, that excitement. There's the little ones drunk. Playing in the background, practicing. Now, from one grey beast with glorious tusks to another beast with maybe not such glorious tusks. They're not too bad. Yes, they might not be quite elephant standard, but I don't think those tusks are particularly negligible. Oh, itchy hock. We've got a pair of very, very muddy warthogs. I can only imagine that they have spent their day, or the heat of the day, rolling around in the mud at Ar Oh, welcome back. Uh, sorry, one second, I'm just on the radio. Tux, can I go in front of the lodge? Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm going to make my way now towards the waterhole from the Mawati River. And I think I can hear elephants screaming around there, so I think there might be Ellie's on their way to the water. Now remember, you are on a live African safari. It's a sweltering 98 degrees Fahrenheit. 37 degrees Celsius and we aren't quite finished with winter yet <laughs> but we didn't really have a, too much of a proper winter this year and we're going to just drive out of the Moati River now this is one of the little two tracks we use in and out of the river to give us access but the elephants have had different ideas about our two tracks and they've pushed rip lots of trees over them so we sometimes have to meander around a bit longer than we used to like we are doing right now since there are elephant trees in the way okay they seem to have pushed down more since the last time i used this two track we used to go through there There we go, that herd we were just with are on the move towards the water. So perfect, perfect timing. Let's get there before them. Oh, this could be fun. They're going to love the water. There's going to be splishing and splashing, some mud throwing. Maybe, Brian, it's quite hot. Maybe we'll position ourselves so we can get an elephant shower. The last elephant shower Brian and I had uh, was actually uh, a dust one, which wasn't nearly as pleasant as a water one. A mud one could be fun, but not for the camera. But while we try to get into position or see what's happening with the headies, uh, let's see how James is in his little sauna. It is getting a little saunerish, everybody, as the sun begins to make its inexorable way down towards the western horizon. Now, let's just have a look here. Uh, an old friend of ours, of course, the old elephant bone here. Now, I made many a mistake trying to figure out exactly which elephant bone this was. I'm still not entirely convinced that I know, but at the moment, I think that it is an elephant humerus. Eh. It is very large indeed, 
I'm not a large fellow, but this bone is at least as large as my trunk and head combined. So probably about... Let's put it on the ground because it's too heavy for me, Eggsy. Well, it's probably about, well, three foot three, I'd say, a metre long. It weighs probably... I'd say it weighs a good 15 kilograms or so. That's one bone, of course. So an elephant, which weighs, I think this came from a big bull, weighs six tons. This is 15 kilograms or about 50 pounds, 35 pounds or so of his total mass. It has also, you can see here, been used very romantically. It does belong to James, at least to Brent Leo Smith and to Jamie Patterson. You can see they've used it as a candle holder. Um, it is a very effective candle holder. Uh, they very kindly donated it to us for use in the sauna slash tent. Then, the other thing I wanted to show you, got absolutely nothing to do with elephants at all, but I found this the other day. It is the Stienbock. And I showed it to many of you on drive. There you are. And what I wanted to show you is how much of it is keratin. So that's what the skull part of the horns look like. And you can actually see where they grow from there. Can you see that, Eggsy? Oh, good. Eggsy can see that, so I hope all the rest of you can. And that's where it grows from, in the skull, and then this keratin sheath covers it on the top and the keratin sheath is exactly what a rhino's horn is made of of course but the rhino horn doesn't have any bone inside it it's plainly keratin like this almost exclusively and no matter what animal you look at out here and it indicates or what uh, ruminant you look at out here it indicates their common ancestry and closeness and rel relativeness rel relativeness is that a word relativity probably Yes. Uh, here is the keratin sheath on the top of an impala. There's a keratin sheath here on top of buffalo as well. So they're all rather closely related. This small steenbok to this enormous buffalo, but not very closely related, of course, to the elephants, which have now reached the water. Here we go. So it's the same little herd we've been spending the whole afternoon with and they've now reached the water. There's the little guy who's fast asleep. so you can hear all the different sounds. Hi, big girl. You tell me a one. This is incredible, they're right next to us. Just amazing. I always find it amazing how different groups of elephants choose to drink in different places. I've decided this is a good spot. Often we find them drinking on the other side. Hi Helen, Helen's in Melbourne and Helen's wondering why do female elephants also have tusks? Well, they're very useful for feeding Helen and they'll use them to pry bark off trees and 
sorry, I thought I saw something there. They're using to pry bark off trees, digging out roots, uh, breaking branches. They're very, very useful tools. So it helps and aids them in feeding. Oof, you can hear how strong the wind is. Now what I'm going to try do is just move back a little bit so we can get in front of them while they're drinking. It's always important to just let the car run for a few seconds. There we go. So relaxed. This is gonna be. So Paul is wondering if why they passed up on the fresh water running out of the pipe. Well, it's not running at the moment, Paul. Look at that little guy. Yes, you. You little nonsense. And it's just what a hot day ordered. Elephants cavorting in the water. Oh, here we go. <laughs> the little one got a squirt with he wanted to or not. Brian, behind there's an elephant chasing warthogs. Oh no, it just changed its mind, deciding water is more entertaining than a warthog. But it thought about chasing a warthog on its way down. But that doesn't look like it's from this herd. Now, if there are quite a lot of Ellies around, as I said, I could hear them all over the place. Look at that. The female looks like she might chase it, that other elephant that arrived. What's going on there? <laughs> oh, happy after cooling down. Is that one going to chase a go-away bird? Thinking about it. Well, oh, go-away birds, I'm out of here before that guy sends his trunk anywhere near me. And this big female is literally coating her whole body in a layer of nice cool mud. And the little one's using her as a rubbing post. There we go, sufficiently coated. I think there's probably only a, a tiny gap that hasn't been. You know, the happiness in the step and the walk now. All cool? Oh, well, it's all good now.
So, lots of nice screenshots, great guys. Remember, share them with us, hashtag Safari Live, or on Twitter, or we'll pop them on Facebook on the Safari Live page. Now, looks like they're going to spread out and feed. Here's little trouble. Now, the temperature's probably dropped a degree or two, what do you think, maybe a bit more, four or five degrees, and that's sort of what seemed to be the trigger for those animals to start moving, and they're not the only ones coming out of the, the thickets. I'm going to sit here a bit longer, see what's happening with these eddies. While we do that, let's go see what James is up to in the tent. I'm so brave, everybody. Look how brave I am. I've got a spider on my face. Now, I know for many of you that would be the most terrifying thing in the world. Uh, for me, it would too, actually, except that this baboon spider has popped its clogs, is no longer, is X, in fact, is quite stiff as a board. You see that, Eggsy? Yes. Sir. Yes, very stiff. Now, what we're going to do is have a look at its fangs under the microscope, whence the wire squill has been. I'm just going to get my seat, of course, so that I might sit down. Eggsy, I'm very old now. You know I'm going to be 40 this year, if you can believe it. I know it's astounding to imagine. Uh, now, there we have the fangs of this spider. And what I would really like to do is kind of split them apart, but I'm not sure that I won't actually damage the spider quite badly. But isn't that amazing? Those are the fangs. It's two of them close together now. Just very, very close together, and that's why it looks like it's one fang. So you can see they've got very long fangs, the baboon spiders. There some of its eyes. I think those are its... no, they can't be. No, those are other sensory organs. I'll show you the eyes now. Let's turn them over. You know what, Eggsy? I've been talking absolute nonsense. Everyone, sorry. <laughs> Let's try that again. Okay, back to microscope. There are the fangs. That makes much more sense. Good grief. That is absolutely horrific. I do apologize profusely, everyone. There you can see the fangs. The back thing there was just some sort of marking. But there are the fangs. One fang, two fangs. There are the petty palps. Those are the sort of uh, helping things. They're the things that push whatever this baboon spider, which is basically a tarantula, wants to eat towards the fangs, and then those fangs dig into them. Now let's see if we can't perhaps lift the fangs slightly. Is that a sound effect you just made? No, we can't. You know, he's got severe rigor mortis, this fellow. She has got severe rigor mortis. We called her Barbara, I think. Barbara the baboon spider. And we don't know how she died, but the best guess we have is that she was killed by a spider hunting wasp. Now, the spider hunting wasp, of course, flies around, uh, most noticeable, of course, by the amazing noise it makes. It goes vzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzz
Just they're not very. They can give you a bit of a nip. It'll probably feel a bit like a bee sting. There are one or two species, especially the sub, um, the sub sort of bark species, that can be a little bit nasty. Uh, but then none of them are going to cause great crates or going to create any harm to you. Um, there is, of course, sorry, I'm coming back to us. I lost the I lost the the spider there for a second. Um, but. Tarantulas, of course, there are two dangerous things. Yes, they can bite you. I don't think any tarantulas, even the South American ones, are likely to cause death straight away. But what they do have is they release those hairs. They release these tiny, fine hairs into the atmosphere. And if you breathe them in, you start coughing. They get stuck in your lungs. They get stuck in your throat. And uh, people actually eat tarantulas. But the thing that they have to be very careful about in South America, especially, is uh, sort of knocking those hairs off before they cook them over the open fire and um, I'm not going to eat this one. Right, while we find you something else interesting to look at, let's head across to Jamie and find out what she has to tell you. Well, we've made our way back from Arethusa. All is very quiet there and as you may have gathered as we kept disappearing off your screen, our signal wasn't, well, was playing up a little bit. It seems as though the gremlins, while we've been away from Arethusa, have decided to strike while we've been gone. And we've moved back onto the southern boundary, onto Gauri Main, to see what we can see and to see whether or not there's any sign of the Queen of Juma Karula deciding to come back from little Gauri. And I've just bumped into Ari, who says he's from Chitwa, and he says that she's still on little Gauri, but you never know. A leopards, unlike generally unlike lions will move about even on the hottest afternoons I remember one afternoon are oh, you horrible little creatures don't run away I couldn't get rusty into reverse <laughs> and the war dogs have gone it would have been so appropriate no they've disappeared it would have been so appropriate because we disappeared while we were busy talking about war dog Oh well, never mind. Okay. Camera for some reason, I don't remember why, but it was one afternoon where we'd gone out late for the sunset safari because it was so hot that our cameras kept shutting down. It was somewhere in the region of about 45 degrees centigrade, so well over 100 Fahrenheit. And, um, and Tingana was just going for a walk. He was just wandering along down the road. He settled down eventually, but it just goes to show that leopards can be moving around and about at absolutely any time of the day and at any temperature, even if it is boiling hot. Now, there's a good chance that Karula might decide to return to the northern parts of her territory and back onto Juma.